It's one of the world's most affordable sources of protein. Hens lay 80 billion a year in the U.S. alone. You're looking at a bird that's producing about an egg every day or every other day. Grade A, double A, cage-free, free-range, pasture-raised, organic, omega-3. White, brown, green, purple, black, large, extra large, incredibly large, incredibly tiny, powdered, and liquid. Bagged, bottled, and in tankers. That lean, mean egg-laying machines, they're just great. If we cook them right, chug them raw, or even sculpt their shells, they're incredible and edible. Now, The Egg on Modern Marvels. Eggs, the reproductive cells from which all life forms evolve, including us. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? The first eggs were laid by sea creatures in the ocean hundreds of millions of years ago. In water, the eggs needed no shells for protection. With reptiles came soft, leathery sacs. Dinosaurs laid the first hard-shelled eggs. Later, but still a hundred million years ago, the first birds laid their eggs in nests. So, the egg wins. Because Gallus domesticus, the chicken as we know it, is only four or five thousand years old. Today, its eggs are a major global food source. Welcome to the egg capital of America, Iowa, where every year 50 million hens lay more than 12 billion eggs. In the entire US, there are as many ladybirds as people, 280 million. Coincidentally, each American eats about the same number of eggs a single chicken puts out, 250 per year. So in effect, every person has a hen with his or her name on it. There are more than 200 breeds of chickens. But the classic white leghorn, originally bred in Italy, is the choice for most egg producers. Too small to be considered a meaty bird, it's built to lay eggs. This mega chicken coop in Stewart, Iowa, is part of Roseacre Farms, the nation's second largest egg producer. Every day, 1.5 million chickens housed here lay more than 800,000 eggs. The process begins at hatcheries, because leghorn hens are cannibalistic and may literally peck each other to death in close quarters, the sharp tips of their beaks are trimmed by machine within two days of birth, a process which egg producers say is painless, similar to trimming a fingernail. Because these leghorns are intended solely for egg production, male chicks are killed within a day or two of hatching, using procedures approved by the American Medical Veterinary Association. At an age of approximately 18 weeks, hens are ready to lay and are moved into production houses. We're in house three right now, which we call 3A and B. A stands for attic, B stands for basement. Um, this cage system here is eight high with a floor in the middle. A typical hen house at Rose Acre is built around 400 foot rows with cages stacked eight high on each side. Every building has eight rows, housing 200 to 250,000 hens. The Stewart, Iowa facility has six houses, accounting for the total chicken population of up to 1.5 million. Each cage houses five to seven chickens. The current industry guideline requires a minimum of 67 square inches of space per bird, about half a square foot. Feed is continually replenished in front of cages, water in the back, and manure is removed by large conveyor belts every sixth day. Eggs roll gently onto smaller belts. Once the egg rolls out onto the four inch belt, the egg gets rolled into the basket here. The basket lifts the egg up and carries it down to our main belt. On the main belt is a mass counter, which counts all the eggs coming out of this row. With freezing winter temperatures in Iowa, 
buildings are enclosed and use artificial light 16 to 17 hours per day. Chickens do sleep about eight hours per night. The caged system accounts for nearly 98% of American egg production. Most eggs sold for $2 per dozen or less are produced this way. An amazingly efficient process, especially when you consider where each egg started in the first place. In this cutaway of the hen, up here we'd be looking at the ovary, the one functional ovary on the left-hand side of the hen's body. And this contains all the future egg yolks going from those that are microscopic in size to the next one that's going to be released. Inside a hen's oviduct, each yolk is covered with a membrane, fibers, and the egg white called albumin. The yolk rotates as it develops, twisting fibers into rope-like strands that anchor the yolk. The strands form the white stringy substance, often seen after cracking a fresh egg. The egg shell, a crystalline form of calcium carbonate, is deposited around the egg just before it's laid. At Roseacre Farms, when eggs leave the hen houses, they travel into grading facilities, where they're inspected, sized, and prepared for market. After passing through an automated egg wash, it's time for QC, quality control. What that person is doing is looking for the bad eggs. Bad eggs meaning bloods, leakers, or really dirty eggs that will not get cleaned. What we got in here is six cameras that are pointed down on the eggs as they go through. Once the uh, camera finds the dirt, pinpoints it, the uh, computer remembers where it is on the roll, and it'll get rewashed automatically. Eggs then move across computer-controlled sensors that check for cracks and weigh the eggs. The computer will know what size it is, and then it'll say, OK, you are a medium, you're a large, you're an X or a jumbo. It'll know where to take it down the line to the carton where it needs to be packed. Here, eggs are also graded. Double A's have the smallest air cells, grade A's slightly larger, and grade B's larger still, with some discoloration. Finally, workers prepare thousands of cartons of fresh eggs for shipment. Normal shelf life for refrigerated eggs is three to four weeks. We're in the cooler right now. It's about 36 degrees in here, or where the eggs are stored for a couple days or the day of, they're being shipped out. With efficient egg production comes environmental challenges. As manure dries, ammonia forms. Levels need to be carefully monitored. Too much ammonia can cause respiratory problems for birds and humans. Scientists from Iowa State University's Egg Industry Institute are working with Roseacre to develop new ways to control ammonia emissions. We're inside what we call the mobile air emission monitoring unit. We basically have shown in lab that uh, different diets can affect uh, the ammonia emission from laying hen manure. Hens are fed a diet of corn, soy meal, vitamins, and minerals. In labs at Iowa State, variations of that diet are fed to chickens in controlled observation chambers to determine not only the effects physically, but psychologically. A happier bird <laughs> is probably a healthier bird, and possibly they're eating better, possibly they're more feed efficient. As a result of animal welfare concerns and legislation in Europe and the United States, alternatives to traditional caged production are becoming more common. Producers like Rose Acre have begun establishing cage-free facilities. Smaller companies like Petaluma Farms in Northern California have been cage-free for more than 20 years. Petaluma Farms routinely houses between 50 and 60,000 hens. Cage-free farms account for a small part of American egg production, less than 2%. The chickens have free choice all day long. Uh, these are the feeders right here. And then behind me, are the nest boxes that we actually bring in from Europe. The environment of the nest boxes is a little dark and a little more secluded for the chickens, so she can feel a little protected when she wants to lay her egg, as opposed to being out in this open area. There's actually a belt that runs underneath them, 
that um, once a day we kind of shoo all the chickens out and the eggs roll onto the spelt. Chicken manure is handled differently at Petaluma Farms, where it's mixed into layers of litter on the chicken house floors. We're using a, a deep litter situation where we put in six to eight inches of rice holes on the floor so the birds can root around and dust themselves. And it actually, on the bottom end of it, as the birds get older, it will eventually compost on its own. Like their counterparts at caged egg farms, Petaluma Farms cage-free chickens still need to have their beaks clipped right after birth. If we left that hook on the end, they would do real damage to each other when they were picking at each other, even to preen each other. Petaluma Farms also raises Rhode Island red chickens in an environment where roosters mingle with hens, producing brown-shelled fertile eggs. Embryos never develop in the eggs because they're refrigerated within a day of being laid. It's really about the ultimate lifestyle for the chicken and providing the whole package, so to speak. The chicken, the rooster, all natural feed. It's, it's all vegetarian feed. And, um, and this is where it all started, in this kind of manner with these birds. You might think a white egg comes from a white chicken and a brown egg from a brown chicken. Not necessarily. The white egg and the brown egg, the difference actually is the earlobe of the chicken. It's a sex link. Um, so the earlobe, if it's white, it's going to be a white egg. And if it's brown, it's going to be a brown egg. Petaluma farm eggs are cleaned, grated, and prepared for market with technology similar to that used by larger caged farms, but on a much smaller scale. Market prices range from $3 to $5 per dozen, but that's still not top dollar for eggs laid in America. The highest price eggs come from some of the lowest tech operations. Eat Well Farm in Dixon, California, is one of relatively few egg producers that allows chickens to pasture graze. British horticulturalist Nigel Walker moved to the U.S. 20 years ago and purchased land to produce organic vegetables and farm fresh eggs laid by chickens who spend most of their days in the great outdoors. We don't even call us free range because uh, free range can literally mean a huge barn with 20,000 chickens in with the door open. The chickens don't, are not used to going out, they won't go out. These chickens go out all the time. We do everything to make it so the chickens have as calm and as uh, idyllic life as possible. Nigel purchases his production red chickens from a local hatchery. But their beaks are not clipped. If two chickens get into a fight here, there's room to run. They'll peck each other. It happens here sometimes, but you know, people are henpecked. There are many henpecked husbands around just as many as there are a few chickens here that are henpecked. The hens spend most of their days grazing on natural grasses or eating organic blends of grain and corn. We soak the wheat overnight so it makes it more digestible for the chickens and they eat a lot of it. About 40% of their feed is this whole wheat. The hens lay their eggs and sleep in chicken coops built on mobile home frames. There's nest boxes inside where the chickens lay their eggs. There's roosts where they roost at night. There's a hanging water drinker, nipple drinkers there. So they give them clean water 24 seven. And then when the very hot days, when we get above 95 degrees, uh, we have these misters, these tubes surrounding the houses. And basically it's fogs that, I mean, it's just like, a, you know, Southern California patio party. The mobile chicken coops are part of Nigel's solution to the manure issue. After the chickens have grazed a pasture for several months, dropping manure as they go, the coops and chickens are moved to a new pasture. The vacated area, having been naturally fertilized, is then available to grow crops or regenerate pasture grasses. That works well for us because the chicken, to us, is an asset. Whereas in a big, huge, mega chicken operation, the chicken, chicken is absolutely poison and how the hell do we get rid of this damn stuff? Whereas for us, it's like, oh my God, it grows the most fabulous vegetables after the chickens have moved on. After a productive life of one to two years, Nigel's chickens also endure what he calls their unhappy day. When these chickens have uh, finished two years of laying here, the third year, they really don't lay enough eggs to pay for their feed, so they have to go. You know, we all, we all have to pay our way. Uh, and what happens to them, we have a good demand 
for spent chickens and they go to a slaughterhouse in Sacramento where they're processed for stewing chickens. Eatwell Farm eggs are sold only on a co-op basis with fresh organic produce to private customers. The eggs cost $8 per dozen, four times the cost of caged production eggs. But Nigel says that buyers can taste the difference. We deliver about uh, 900 boxes of produce every week and the customers get the eggs with their boxes and we have uh, 200 people waiting to get into the farm um, and it can take anything from five, six, seven months to get a spot and there's never enough eggs. That's just the reality. Whether a dozen eggs is worth two dollars or eight is a highly subjective choice when only a hen's environment is considered. But what about taste and nutrition? The determining factors might surprise you. Fresh eggs usually reach markets within two days of being laid. Then comes the shopper's dilemma. So many choices and confusing labels. What's an egg eater to do? Let's start with taste and nutritional value. I know people who pay several dollars more a dozen for the eggs because they don't want to buy eggs from hens who are kept in cages. That's a philosophical decision. And they have the ability to pay more for it, and I think that's great. In terms of nutritional value, there is no nutritional difference. So the egg laid by a hen who is maintained in a cage is going to be same as the nutritional value from an egg laid by a hen that was on the ground. What can affect an egg's taste and nutrition, however, is the hen's diet. The term organic on a carton can make a difference. Typically, the birds that are producing organic eggs, they have to be fed a diet that's made up of grains that were also produced organically. Another significant egg carton term is omega-3 enhanced. Hens producing these eggs are fed a diet enriched with flaxseed, fish oil, or DHA algae to produce fatty acids that can help prevent heart disease. If a person really wants to get those omega-3 fatty acids, this is one way to get them. So it's really a matter of what are you willing to pay to get increased omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. If the choices among eggs sold in cartons aren't complicated enough, add another decision, shelled, liquid, or powder. More than a third of all eggs now leave producers without shells. Like its nearby sister farm in Stewart, Iowa, this Rose Acre facility in Guthrie Center houses hundreds of thousands of hens. But most eggs here are processed through the facility's breaking plant. As in Stewart, machinery in Guthrie cleans and sorts the eggs automatically. But checks or cracks are detected not by visual inspection, but sound waves. What we have is acoustical crack detection system. There's little probes that are tapping the egg and it's listening for the different sounds in the egg. A cracked egg has a different sound. It'll pick that up and reject that egg that has a crack in the shell. Eggs with imperfections, and many without, depending on market demand, are cracked and separated by machine. It's the same technique a kitchen cook would use, but the machine does it a bit faster, at a rate of 28,000 eggs per hour. Each egg moves into a cracker, where a knife gently cracks the shell and splits it apart. The egg drops into a small container with an opening large enough for the white to separate and drip into a tray below. Incredibly, this is old technology. A newer egg breaker just installed does the same job at the rate of 108,000 eggs per hour. The shells, rich in calcium, are collected in containers and sold or given to area farmers to be used as crop fertilizer. They also show promise in their ability to absorb carbon dioxide in the production of hydrogen and collagen, harvested from eggshell membranes, offers numerous commercial applications. Fresh from the breaker, the whites, yolks, and whole liquid eggs wait in giant chilled holding tanks for their next stop in the production line. 
pasteurization. The sweet spot for pasteurization is only a matter of 10 degrees. Hot, but not too hot, please. Normally, we gotta be above 140 degrees to get a good bacteria kill. But yeah, we don't want to get above 150 degrees or we'll start cooking egg inside that bread. It could get ugly pretty quick. Without their natural shells to protect them, liquid egg products require sanitary processing. Basically, we're going through some checks to make sure everything is sterile. And the first thing that we do is we purchase the bags that are irradiated already to make sure there's no bacteria growing inside the bag. And then from there, the machine is kept sterile with steam. So the steam keeps the machine hot enough to inhibit bacteria growth. The liquid eggs are sent on their way in packaging, ranging from 160 egg bags to stainless steel tanker trucks, holding 48,000 pounds of liquid. More than 400,000 whites or yolks. The trucks are bound for manufacturers of products like baked goods or mayonnaise. The processing of liquid eggs gives them double the shelf life of refrigerated shelled eggs. Nearly two months. But some customers need even longer periods of guaranteed freshness. Enter the powdered egg. In another state-of-the-art machine, liquid becomes powder at a rate of 4,000 pounds per hour. Behind me, what we have is what we call an egg dryer. What it does is pressurize the liquid egg up to 3,000 PSI and spray that into this box dryer. Inside the box, it's about 440 degrees. Within six seconds, the liquid egg is turned into a powder before it hits the floor. Outside the dryer, powdered eggs are sifted and placed into 50-pound bags and boxes for shipping. The dried eggs are usually sold to institutions and ice cream producers. But liquid product has caught on with many consumers, especially those who want only egg whites to keep their cholesterol down. But are egg yolks really that bad for us? 15 years ago, eggs got a bad name. In particular, yolks were suddenly considered as unhealthy as fatty red meats, rich ice creams, and cheesecake. But that was then, and this is now. Research scientists in several departments at Iowa State University have studied the effect on the human body of eating whole eggs. They've all come to virtually the same conclusion as published health recommendations. The American Heart Association has it set at a recommendation of four eggs per week. Other groups will have that ramped up to about one egg a day or seven a week would be. So an egg a day is still considered to be fine for the average, for the normal healthy adult without any other factors of high cholesterol or heart disease. Other tests at Iowa State have involved feeding rats various sources of protein to determine just how well egg protein ranks in nutritional value. The verdict? You don't need to eat an expensive steak to get a protein fix when an egg selling for 15 cents will do the job. Whether it's a bodybuilder trying to put on muscle or whether it's just an adolescent who's growing through a normal uh, life cycle, egg protein is still gonna be the best protein on a per gram basis to, to grow or to put or to make new muscle. How's this for proof? A body like this can be yours, but you'll have to drink raw egg whites more than you can possibly imagine. Meet Eamon Fowler, professional bodybuilder. You see, 23 inch. To achieve this physique, every day he repeatedly deadlifts 700 pounds, bench presses 400, and consumes raw egg whites. He doesn't stop at 10, not at 20, not even 30, but 40. It's very good. And that's not all. He eats another 40 scrambled. I need every day between six and 700 gram protein. Like this here, I need every day one bottle between cook and drink. 
Eamon and many other bodybuilders get their daily protein fix from California-based Eggology. Containers of 48,000 fresh chilled egg whites from cage-free chickens fed organic diets are delivered to its production facility, where they're processed for bodybuilders, restaurant chefs, and home cooks. Despite the egg whites having already passed inspection at their original source, Eggology runs them through another round of safety checks, particularly because so many buyers drink the product uncooked. A USDA inspector continually monitors production. A proprietary, non-chemical, all-natural process adds a unique characteristic to these egg whites. A four-month shelf life, twice that of normal liquid eggs. Because we're a USDA plant, we have to substantiate anything that's on that label. So if we're going to claim four months, we have to prove it continuously. So out of every day's production, we pull samples, and four months later, we have to open up a sample in front of our inspector. Eggology has taken the concept of only egg white protein into uncharted territory with yolkless ice creams. Desserts, they say, are so rich, you'd never guess there was anything missing. Doggy treats that are actually frozen egg whites and instant scramblings. Four egg whites packaged in a microwave container. Ready to become nuke scrambled in 90 seconds without even taking the top off. While the bodybuilders and egg white lovers of California work to create new forms of designer eggs, back in the egg production capital of Iowa, the art of egg eating is a bit more traditional. The place to eat eggs in Iowa City is the Hamburg Inn 2. As a major stop on the Iowa caucus political highway, the walls are lined with pictures of winners and losers who came to the inn to get votes and eat eggs. So what causes the hungry crowds to gather every morning starting at sunrise? Here are the secrets of extraordinary egg cooker, Polly Christ. First, you crack the egg on the grill like this. You want to do it slowly and carefully. For Polly, sunny side up means the white is cooked all the way through, but not the yolk. Now, the trick to turning eggs over without breaking the yolks. Just crack the egg as same before. This time you want to kind of get them both together so it's easier to flip. It's all on the wrist. The egg never leaves the griddle when it's flipped. Over easy just cooks the white. Over medium cooks the yolk just a touch. What I do is just lightly touch it. And it's, it, it's cooked, but not all, all the way. It's usually just cooked around the edges like this. And you see that yellow right there? That's what you want. That's nice and pretty right there. The Hamburg, like most restaurants, serves only grade double A eggs. They stand up tall on a plate with firm yolks and thick whites. Grade A's are still good, but a bit less high profile. The thinner whites of a grade B make for a much flatter fried egg. And how about a poached egg? What's my secret? You want to look for the foam. And as soon as the foam starts bubbling over the top is when you turn down the heat. Now you can see the actual egg still floating in there. They're not broken. Perfect. All the way cooked. For omelets, the bigger the cooking surface, the easier it gets. Just toss, spread, load, and fold. I've got the Iowa omelet with pancakes. And Mary, what do you have? Iowa omelet and pancakes. The Hamburg Inn's signature Iowa omelet is filled with cheese, ham, and hash browns. Not on the side, but folded inside. An average omelet at the Hamburg contains two grade double-A large eggs and serves one person. But there is one bird egg that can be made into an omelet to feed six people or more. It's not from a chicken. This is an egg, more specifically an ostrich egg, containing 24 times the white and yolk of an average chicken egg. 
And this is ostrich farm owner, Doug Osborne, giving his daily warnings to ravens eyeing the piles of eggs that have been laid overnight. There go the ravens. There we go. I'll stay away for an hour or two. 1,500 ostriches currently live on Osborne's OK Corral ostrich farm in Oro Grande, California. He raises many for meat, which is in great demand for its flavor, tenderness, and low fat content. But he is also one of the nation's most prominent producers of ostrich eggs. And yes, they are edible. One of the, the things we believe here on the ostrich farm is that you are what you eat. And if you are what you eat, the ostrich lives 100 years, he runs 50 miles an hour, and he mates three times a day. I mean, what more could you ask for? <laughs> For reasons that should be obvious, the OK Corral is a cage-free farm. Ostriches standing as high as nine feet tall, with more devastating leg kick power than a horse, wouldn't have it any other way. They don't fly. They don't need to. You get something about 350, 400 pounds that comes by at 40 miles an hour and hits you, you're not going to have a good experience. I think it'd be something like the NFL on steroids. Like chickens, ostriches are followers when it comes to nesting. When one decides to lay an egg in a particular location, others literally stand in line to follow. We're out here in the southeast corner of the uh, ostrich pen, and the uh, eggs are laid on a daily basis. Hens will generally lay about two eggs a week. And in his pen, we have 450 breeders, of which about 300 are hens. So we get hundreds of eggs on a weekly basis. And this is a typical nest of ostrich eggs here. And they put little pods of, of dirt. They pick up dirt and sprinkle the dirt on top of the eggs. And I, I suspect that uh, the reason for that, in Africa, this would be a good camouflage, maybe a, a, an odor proofing or something where other animals wouldn't come along and want to eat or destroy their eggs. After gathering the eggs, Osborne candles them with a low-tech flashlight. Those showing signs of fertility are placed in an incubator. Infertile eggs are prepared for shipment. Ostrich eggs actually have two markets, the contents for eating and the shells as collector's items or for artwork. 20 miles from the OK Corral farm sits the West Coast home of the ostrich omelet, the Summit Inn on historic Route 66. There you go, I want to show you the way I open the eggs. When an order comes in for an ostrich omelet, the first kitchen gadget Chef Aureliano Rios chooses is a Dremel, the kind of tool a mason uses to drill into concrete. Because the shells alone sell for $10 or more, the contents of the egg are emptied through a tiny hole. Even the most powerful stone Dremel bit requires serious pressure to pierce the hard shell. An ostrich eggshell is so hard, a 200-pound man could stand on it, and it wouldn't break. So how do ostrich chicks ever make their way out? Over time, approximately 45 days, thousands of microscopic pores in the shell expand, making it breakable at just the right time for a baby ostrich to peck or kick its way out. The expansion of pores occurs with all eggs, including those laid by a chicken. For the ostrich egg chef, once a hole is drilled into a shell, a vacuum device empties out the white and the yolk. And the scrambled egg mix finds its way to the griddle, a very large griddle. A whole ostrich egg packs over 2,000 calories and 33 grams of protein, coincidentally, the minimum daily requirement for an average healthy adult. The cholesterol level? Approximately 16 times that of a chicken egg. This omelet also includes cheese and ostrich meat. The real cooking trick comes when it's time to fold the omelet for plating. There you go. Voila. The only single egg omelet that won't fit on a large plate. How about that, huh? Big omelet. Oh, wow. Whoa. Look at that baby, would you? My that is goodness. so good. Cheddar cheese, avocado, hash browns, mm. sausage. 
Exotic eggs don't just come from unusual birds. Some chicken eggs fall into that category as the result of preparation. Any purple egg may not seem appetizing to the uninitiated. But at Philippe's restaurant in Los Angeles, their homemade pickled eggs are so popular, they need to make a new batch of 600 every three days. They've been serving them for more than 40 years. Philippe's is best known for its French dip roast beef sandwiches. But regular customers frequently add a pickled egg to their platters. The eggs originally became popular as bar snacks in the early 1900s, serving right next to jars of pickled pig's feet. The purple color comes from fresh beet juice. Twice a week, 36 bunches of beets are steamed and then immediately peeled. After it's peeled, we put them into this slicer. We slice it and it goes right underneath where all the spices and the vinegar, and it's ready to use it for pickling the eggs. 600 hard-boiled eggs are soaked in the vinegar and spiced beet juice for three days. Then they move to the countertop, where they stay fresh up to a week. Pickling, in this case, is intended to add flavor more than preservation. Some newbies need to be talked into trying one. I say, OK, try it. If you don't, uh, you don't like it, you're not going to pay for it. It's on the house. Slice it, and they taste it, and they ask for another one. When I came here, I came with somebody who had been coming here for quite a while, and they said that you got to try them at least once just to say you did. I mean, how often do you get to eat a purple egg? So I went for it, and I, I really liked it. I didn't expect that combination of vinegar and sweetness to be as good as it was. If you find the color purple intriguing, how about the color black? This is an Asian delicacy known as a thousand-year-old egg. It's also called a century egg, or simply a preserved egg. It is not hard-boiled. It is merely packed in clay, ash, salt, lime, and straw for up to a month, not really a century. The cooking is caused by fermentation. At specialty restaurants like Typhoon in Santa Monica, California, the egg is simply sliced in half, revealing a garish green yolk with a smell similar to ammonia. And it's served over tofu. Some people say it smells like urine. Um, but when you taste it, it you, that taste is not there. That smell that you smell is not it, the taste you get. It's a very creamy, sort of soft, um, it has a yolky flavor to it, but a very rich, it's much richer than the normal chicken egg yolk. Upstairs from Typhoon in the Hump Sushi Bar, Chef Kiyoshiro Yamamoto creates exotic egg dishes on a much smaller scale with quail eggs, poached precisely at 140 degrees, so only the yolk cooks, not the white. Then he prepares his own spoon-sized omelets. With the sea urchin, oysters, and the king crab, and Japanese mushroom. For a sushi chef, quail eggs aren't simply food. They're miniature works of art. The simple shape of the egg has inspired artists for centuries. Today, an Iowa sculptor has become world famous for his own works of egg art. How does he create relief carvings like this? in a shell less than 1 32nd of an inch thick. The perfectly shaped form of the egg has inspired artists for centuries. These are Russia's famous Fabergé eggs from the early 1900s, made from gold, marble, and jewels. Even simple Easter eggs have been elevated to innovative art. But few artists have had the patience and steady hand to perform work like eggshell sculptor Gary LeMaster of Iowa City. What began as a hobby 30 years ago has evolved into a life's passion. Working with an ostrich shell, Gary is able to carve layers of relief. Delicate power dental tools allow him to work within a custom-built case which vacuums shell dust as he carves. I started just shaping things, taking off the outer layer, 
we create the, the illusion of depth because we're only working with about a, somewhere between a 32nd of an inch and maybe a 16th of an inch thick shell here. And so you always point the burr towards what element is going to remain or appear to be higher than the one next to it. This is a good place to show because we have part of a leaf here that is rolled over on itself. And instead of uh, having being satisfied with just this, this sort of 90 degree angle here to show the depth, we'll actually go in and undercut it, which will create even more of a shadow and therefore more of an illusion of depth. The natural colors of different eggs give Yeri even more creative opportunities. Beneath the green surface of an emu eggshell lie multicolor layers. There's no paint on here, which people traditionally think there is when they see them. When you're carving with uh, an aggressive burr, usually you can get different color layers uh, from, from the egg. Uh, the white, which is the deepest, and it's just paper thin. Uh, the teal, which I'm working on now, and I think this is going to eventually go down to the white. And then, of course, the dark outer layer. Uh, this is a commission for, for someone in the great Pacific Northwest whose wife loves dolphins. Prices for Gary's carved shells range from $100 for simple designs to several thousand for commissioned works. The lattice or lace-like carvings he calls filigree often draw the most attention. always start at the most fragile spot because you don't want to end at a fragile spot. You're almost guaranteeing that you're going to break the egg. I'll go back and I'll try to make this even closer together than it already is. There's a flower in here and there's a star and there's other shapes. There's a heart, but this is the sort of egg and the sort of carving I do the night before I know I'm going to have major surgery or something because this takes focus and you can't be thinking about anything else, he says as he's talking. The egg is a gift. It has drawn our interest for thousands of years for its simple design, delicate taste, and affordable nutrition almost always too appetizing to be left uneaten, and often too intriguing to be left untouched. They're perfect in, in what they do. They're strong until you start messing with them like this. And sometimes I feel a little odd as an artist trying to make something perfect more perfect. They represent life itself.